Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our meeting this morning, April 11th. I'll call the meeting to order. And if you'd rise and join me in singing O Canada. O Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love, in all of us command with glowing hearts we see thee rise the true north strong and free from far and wide o oh canada we stand on guard for thee god keep our land Glorious and free, O oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Madam Clerk, would take the roll call, please. Councillor Mackey. Present. Councillor McKay. Councillor Carlton. Councillor Pringle. Present. Councillor Allwood. Councillor Nielsen. Councillor Patterson. Councillor Dickert. Councillor Kentner. Councillor Keaveny. Councillor Body. Councillor Gregg. Councillor Dobreen. Warden Melm. Present. Councillor Matrasovs. Councillor Bordignon. Present. Councillor Doug Hutchinson. Councillor Tom Hutchinson. Present. Thank you. We have all members in attendance today, with the exception of Councillor Eccles and. Thank you, Tara. And indeed, I want to welcome our two alternates, Tom Allwood and Doug Hutchison, here this morning. Okay, uh, before I begin, I want to uh, respectfully acknowledge that we are gathering on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation. The people of the three fires known as Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations. And further, we give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, known collectively as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, the traditional keepers of these lands and waters since time immemorial. To our south lies the traditional territories of the Six Nations of the Grand River. We are dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of truth, reconciliation, and friendship with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Is there any uh, declaration of interest related to any item on today's council meeting agenda? Oh, Councillor uh, Patterson. Thank you, Warden. Uh, advising that I will, will be declaring a conflict during the closed meeting. Okay, thank you. That'll be during the uh, committee of the whole agenda. Right. Okay. Good. Any others? Not seeing. If one should arise during the course of the meeting, you can declare it at that time, of course. We have no closed meeting matters, no reports. We have a bylaw. Um, oh, sorry. My mistake. Breezing right along. I missed the minutes. So I guess we'll do that. Let's go back. Can I have a motion to adopt the minutes of the uh, March 28th meeting? Councillor Kentner and Councillor Body. Any discussion? 
All those in favor? There we go. Thank you very much. Now, we have no closed meeting matters, no reports. We have a bylaw, the confirming bylaw. Someone care to move that, please? Councillor Nielsen, Councillor Dickert, any discussion? All in favor? That is carried. News and celebrations. Always a popular time. Councillor McKay. Through you, Warden, uh, last meeting, county council meeting, uh, I seem to not have my uh, mic working, uh, so I had to do sign language, and it was uh, over uh, good roads, so it's no longer Ontario, it's just good roads. A lot of people still are using the old uh, version of it, and uh, I have a meeting coming up next Saturday before the conference starts and I'll bring that up and uh, give them a heads up that there will be some uh, letters coming forward to try to join the two together Roma and Good Roads. Uh, I think not that long ago before I was on Good Roads the last time uh, they had tried it and there was some there I don't know there was some conflict or whatever but I think if I say you know with our budgets being cut back, you only allowed one conference. I think it's time that they join together and then I'll follow up and uh, see how many more agree with that. But I think there's a lot of uh, communities now that are only sending their rep to uh, one meeting. So we'll see what we can do to make it a lot easier anyway. So thank you. Thanks, Terry. Anyone else? Councillor Decker. Thank you, Warden Milton and Warren County Council. I uh, just wanted to recognize our junior C champion, Hannah Rebarons. They uh, were successful in winning the Pollock Division of the PGAHL this Monday evening. Uh, it was a 21-year wait, and I know that's not much to a Maple Leafs fan, but uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we do wish them well. And uh, <laughs> they do uh, start the next series against Allison this Friday night. We've had great uh, you know, 1,100, 1,200 people out to the games. It's been a, a great uh, community builder. and. Uh, we're very proud of our team for what they've accomplished thus far. Thank you. Well, in spite of your comments, I'll congratulate you. Anyone else? Councillor Matrasovs. Uh, thank you. Through you, the warden, I would like to share some good news uh, with my county colleagues. Uh, yesterday, it's been announced, uh, and this morning, the, our, our own Town of the Blue Mountains media release has just gone out, that we have been the successful applicants of receiving $50,000 in U.S. funding from Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, in order to be able to fund and support youth-led, youth-led, uh, youth youth-created climate action projects in the form of micro grants. Uh, so uh, anything from $1,000 US up to $5,000 US. Now, interestingly, because uh, there are only 100, 100 municipalities in the world that have received this funding, only six are in Canada, and we are certainly not the size of Kitchener or Guelph uh, or Halifax, uh, three of the others, or Oakville, uh, four of the others that are that are on the list. Uh, so I made sure that when I was putting the application in with the funders that I explained that even our high school students do not go to school in the town of Blue Mountains, and that we really think on a regional community basis, and how can we make that work? And their response was quite uplifting, that they said, absolutely, and not only do we have our own town of Blue Mountains uh, community uh, climate action plan, but we have a great county climate action plan. So if there are projects that come up that are viable, that, that help contribute towards that greater regional uh, response, we're going to want to hear those applications. So I've asked if uh, the clerk can forward on the, the information in case you have not received it directly, because we would like to hear from youth groups, organizations that are working with young adults uh, from ages 15 to 24, it includes our colleges, and, and reach out to our high schools. If there are projects that might have a link in terms of how it is going to help contribute towards climate action here in the county, as well as the connections that it can make to the watersheds, for example, that we all share, we want to hear from, from those organizations and how they can support and uplift youth to be empowered to actually create their own projects. So look for that information in your inboxes and please reach out to me if there's uh, some questions about how we might be able to 
it could be anything from it could be it could be a high school program that comes up with a dramatic uh, uh, dramatic arts performing on education and awareness of climate action that starts in your municipality and then does a traveling roadshow right across the county. So this is the kind of project we'd really like to hear from. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Very exciting news indeed. Councillor Debrine. Thank you, Warden, and good morning, County Council. I would just like to remind everyone that Maple Fest is happening this weekend, April 13th from 9 till 4, and Sunday, April 14th from 10 till 3 at the Love's Sweetness Sugar Bush in downtown Holstein. I'd also like to announce that Junction Community Initiatives, a not-for-profit organization heading out of Southgate is holding its second annual International Women's Day Awards Gala on April 27th. It is actually recognizing women of excellence throughout South Gray, that includes uh, West Gray, Chatsworth, Gray Highlands, and Southgate. Um, they are all recognized by other members of the community, so we're looking forward to celebrating with them on the 27th. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. And that is always a good event. Both of those are good events. Anyone else? Councillor Allwood. Uh, thank you, Warden, through you. I'd just uh, like to announce that the South Great Chamber of Commerce uh, Home and Garden Show is happening on the weekend of uh, April 27th and 28th at the uh, Lushington Arena. Hopefully uh, you can find some time to drop by. Uh, We've got some interesting exhibits planned there. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Hopefully spring will cooperate and everybody will be in the proper humor to, to show up to something like that. Anyone else? Okay, not seeing any. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Hutchison, Councillor Matrasovs, all in favor? That is carried. We'll just take a minute to switch over to our committee of the whole meeting. Thank you, Rob. I'll call our committee of the whole meeting uh, today, April 11th, to order. Is there any declaration of interest on this agenda? Councillor Patterson, I've got yours. Thank you. Councillor uh, Deckard. Uh, when we get to the closed session, I will be declaring an interest on uh, one of the items of the closed agenda. Okay. Anyone else? Councillor Hutchison. Thank you. Uh, I too will be declaring conflict on one of the closed session items um, when we get to the closed session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison. Um, I will also be declaring a conflict on item 8.3 on today's agenda closed session. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Um, Business arising from the minutes. We have a notice of motion here from Councillor Debreen. Councillor Debreen, you will move that motion. Is there a seconder? Councillor Keaveny, you're going to speak to the motion. Councillor uh, Debreen, please. Thank you, Warden Milne, and thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to put my name forward for election to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Uh, Board of Directors County Caucus. I think the resolution before you speaks for itself. It is a requirement. Uh, once the application process or the nomination process opens sometime later this month, I will require this note, this motion or this resolution to accompany that nomination. So I look forward to uh, receiving your support or your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Debreen. Councillor Keaveny. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and good morning, everyone. And I just wanted to thank Barb on behalf of the County Council for putting your name forward to represent Gray County at AMO. So thank you, Councillor Jabreen. Thank you. Anyone else? Any discussion? I, too, want to extend my thanks to Councillor Jabreen. She's done a wonderful job so far, and I expect that will continue. All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. We have two delegations this morning. Uh, the first is uh, we have Bruce King and Stephen Couchman. Uh, they're here to speak about the Kalapur Wilderness Trail Association. So gentlemen, 
Come on up to the podium. Um, I presume staff have primed you on how to use that microphone. <laughs> Good morning, Warden and uh, members of council. My name is Bruce King. I'm the president of the Kalapur Wilderness Trails Association. Stephen Couchman, another board member, and I are here to celebrate the 50 years that the Kalapur Trails and Gray County have been working together in the Kalapur area. The Kalapur Trails are a 50 kilometer trail network located in the southwest corner of the town of the Blue Mountains, immediately west of Gray Road 2. If you could, <laughs> although it's hard to see, on that map, which shows the public, all the public lands in the Kalapur Uplands area. In the lower right corner, you can see the, the county forest is uh, highlighted uh, there. So it's just west of Gray Road 2, right on the boundary of Blue Mountains and Gray Highlands. Uh, and the trails really are possible because of all the public lands uh, in the area. Uh, the trails are managed for cross-country skiing in the winter and walking and mountain biking in the summer. The trails are open to the public with no user fees. The origin of the trails goes back to 1973 when they were built by members of the University of Toronto Outing Club to provide opportunities for cross-country skiing. This 1973 map of the trail system shows, again, sort of in the lower right-hand corner, the county forest portion of the trail system, uh, which are you know, the series of little loops down there. So the, the, the county forest has been part of our trail system for just over 50 years now. That The, the county forest track there is 300 acres and has about six kilometers of trails. And the trails in the area are, are largely unchanged since 1973, although uh, they're now connected to the remainder of the system. If you look at the, the map, you can see it was a little island off on its own at that time. The trails in the beginning were very rustic uh, with lots of manual labor, hand saws, hand brush cutting. Uh, we were grateful for mechanization on some of those things. And just for your information, that cabin on the lower left corner is the University of Toronto Outing Club cabin where the system started. However, that's what, how the trail started in 1973. But things changed fairly quickly. The area, uh, uh, you know, it was university students who started, but they became popular with local residents and visitors to the area. Over time, management gradually shifted to local volunteers and by 2012, the association was uh, incorporated to manage the trails. Uh, here you see uh, photos of an annual meeting and some of the meetings we've had to discuss trail priorities, trying to get uh, broad community input into our management. The association pays for uh, the materials for bridge and boardwalk construction, other maintenance, insurance, snow plowing, toilet rental, um, the association organizes land use agreements with each of the landowner agencies. Costs are primarily covered by voluntary memberships in our association and donations. As I said, we do not charge user fees for the trails, and we do not receive go any government funding, funding on an ongoing basis. When we started the trails, they were intended strictly for cross-country skiing. That has continued to be the winter focus, but the trails are now very popular in the summer for hiking and mountain biking. And over time, the trails really have introduced so many users to the natural value and beauty of the Kalapur Upland area. It really is one of the gems of Gray County. You know, and as part of the 50th anniversary celebrations, we uh, ran a series of walks that focused on birds, forests, ecology, and geology. And we hope to continue those types of educational activities in the future. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, oops. Well, I'm going backwards. Yeah, down, down. Down. There we go. Yeah, yeah. All right. 
uh, though only about six kilometers uh, of uh, the 50 kilometer network is the county forest part of our trail system. Uh, it plays a very special role uh, because it is mainly on old forest lanes on gently rolling terrain. Uh, it provides easy, tra easy trails that are popular for less experienced or uh, shall we say less energetic skiers, bikers, hikers, and families. Um, we are trying to make the trails even more user-friendly by removing selected rocks. This is also, uh, this also helps uh, make the trails better for skiing in low snow conditions, something that is likely to become more common over time. Uh, we are also working to minimize environmental impact in damp areas through trail armory. The Kalapur trails are maintained, uh, as Bruce has mentioned, by volunteers who blaze, prune, brush cut, maintain signs, pick up garbage, provide overall monitoring, and raise the funds required uh, to do this work. Uh, when we started, the trails were rather rustic, as uh, Bruce has mentioned, uh, but since then we have worked very hard to improve the standards so that we can provide a safe, enjoyable trail system that is to an international standard. Uh, in recent years, we've also become increasingly conscious of the environmental values of the area. Uh, these photos uh, show our volunteers uh, tree planting uh, just next to the, the county forest property uh, on old field that was not reforesting naturally due to soil compaction. Our volunteers have also been doing work managing invasive species. Uh, for example, we have been pulling garlic mustard in the county forest for a number of years, uh, and we'll be out again in a few weeks if anybody wants to join us on that. When the trails first started, uh, we interacted mostly with the Ministry uh, of Natural Resources, but more recently for the county forest section, we have been working with county staff uh, with the assistance of Conservation Authority. We would very much like to thank uh, the county for the constructing the formal parking lot in 2022 at the south end of the, the trail system, along with providing winter snow plowing. Uh, this is substantially increased use of the area in both winter and summer. As an example of the collaboration and the rela collaborative relationship, last year county staff produced uh, signs uh, with maps uh, for posting on every trail intersection in the county forest tract and our volunteers installed uh, all of the signage uh, in the area. Why do we do it? Uh, well, this is why. Uh, uh, the Kalapur area provides an extraordinary opportunity both for ourselves to experience the outdoors, uh, but for, for the children in the community. Uh, one of our current priorities is fostering the next generation of trail users who will hopefully uh, will also become the next generation of volunteers. Uh, you'll notice the picture in the middle there that's among other programs we've offered. We recently ran an orienteering event uh, for, for young people and children so they could learn how to find their way in the woods uh, without the use of a cell phone. Uh, so on behalf of the Colaport Trail volunteers, we would like to thank County for its contribution to recreation and environmental protection in Kalapur. These types of facilities serve local residents to, and also draw visitors to the area. Uh, just as an example, it's one of the key reasons that um, my wife and I moved to this area uh, and raised our family here and run our business here. Um, uh, we encourage the county to continue to provide the necessary resources to support the effective management of the county forest system and we are your partners uh, in this work, and we look forward to many more years of dialogue and collaboration. Um, I believe you've received the 50th anniversary publication in your packages. We also have um, hard copies and maps if anybody would like one. Um, and um, um, uh, just uh, just two other things, if I have a moment more off, uh, slightly off script, an invitation is open. If anybody would like to come and experience the Colopore Forest winter or summer, we're, we're there to, to, uh, uh, to lead you there. And though Bruce hates me saying this, I just want to take a quick moment to, to, on the record to recognize Bruce King 
Uh, he has been um, a steward of the Kalapur trails and the trail system, including the Bruce Trail, uh, in, uh, in this region for over 50 years. Uh, and we are super lucky to have people like Bruce who care deeply about uh, the land uh, that we live on. So thank you all very much and uh, look forward to any questions. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. And it does indeed uh, sound like it's a very collaborative uh, uh, partnership. And we do appreciate, everyone appreciates the efforts that you and your uh, members put into uh, maintaining that trail system. Um, yeah, it, it really is heartening to see organizations like that that are focused on bringing the youth forward and making sure they're aware of what's going on around them without a cell phone in their hand. Any questions for the delegation? Well, again, thank you very much, gentlemen. Appreciate your time. Sorry. What? Oh, Scott. Yeah, you want to say something, Scott? Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I, I would just like to uh, echo the warden's sentiments on behalf of staff. Uh, it's been great working with the Kalapur Wilderness Trails Association, uh, both within the county forest and as part of the, the larger participation, their participation in the county's outdoor management group, which started uh, largely when we saw the rush of people to our natural areas uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And they've just been fantastic to work with and, and their efforts to maintain the trails and, and to promote this part of Gray County has, has been uh, exemplary. So thank you very much on behalf of staff. Thanks, Scott. Well said. Thanks again, gentlemen. Okay, our next delegation, we have uh, Peter Dunbar. Peter or Doug? Peter, Peter, we have Peter. Uh, he's here to talk about road safety at Highway 4 and Side Road 35 in Gray Highlands. So welcome, Peter. The floor is yours, sir. Mr. Warden, council members and staff, good morning. And I already feel blessed that the first two topics were the environment and trails. What a great way to administrate the, your end of the business. It's uh, stuff I worked on for 50 years also. And Bruce was a, a leader way ago. You hate to talk about that because it makes you sound really old, but he is, <laughs> but he's done a great job. So. Um, Doug and myself lived in this area for 90% of our lives and uh, are very familiar with this intersection. Uh, in my much younger days, I used to travel from Wasega Beach across through there to play in Durham. And, and so I, I've seen many accidents at this intercrossing. It, it is a dangerous spot. The police will verify that there have been many accidents at this juncture. Uh, and I think there's a lot of reasons why it happens, and it's they're all bad. But the one is uh, coming from the south to the north, approaching Highway 4, you come over a hill, and you're immediately upon Highway 4. It's very quick. And at, at right now, there's a large bush growing about a quarter of a mile or, or an eighth of a mile from the intersection. And so you're you're blanked off and you can't see Highway 4 well. So it, that bush needs to be taken out. It's called daylighting. It's the same thing you do on trails. You got to make the approach safer. The far side is, is okay. There's a church on the northeast corner. But what we've seen over these years is a lot of people either traveling too fast, not knowing where they're going, but the accidents at that corner have been substantial. So as a good citizens, I think you have to participate in government and bring your issues forward and not just complain at the coffee shop. So here, Doug and I are presenting to you what we think needs to be done at that corner. So we submit the following issues for your consideration. Daylighting, number one, on the south, coming to the approach on the south side, needs the bush needs to be taken down. Number two, there needs to be larger advanced intersection signs. Number three, we need to go high tech and get the stop sign to the large and uh, solar panel style 
lit up one so people are seeing this. Now, it's not just bad drivers. It's, you know, the cell phone and people are traveling up here as tourists. There's a lot of reasons why people aren't really concentrating on the map. The large stop sign with the solar panel, uh, an additional rumble uh, road act or approaches would be beneficial. So there's three or four things that the Department of Public Works uh, will know automatically how to improve this uh, corner. So there, Doug is lucky to be alive. He was driving a fully loaded dump truck uh, for Flesherton or Fleshcon, and he was hit by a van doing in excess of 100 clicks. He, they tore up the van, the driver lived, but very lucky. Doug was hit as he was driving towards uh, the west and the dump truck was destroyed and put into the ditch and then into the field. The van ended up in the field. So the, the dramatic problem here is not the first one. It's happened before. The police, uh, when we talked to them, said, yes, there's been lots of serious accidents this corner. So our point would be is that this needs to be put into the Public Works Health, Health and Safety Committee. I'm not sure if that's the nomenclature or not, but someone has to look at this and improve it before we lose some other citizens or tourists. So uh, entertain any questions. If you have any, it's pretty blunt and forward. Change the access, put up more warning signs, get a decent stop sign. Right now it has a small little stop sign. I mean, that's common for a lot of places. This is a sort of shortcut for lots of people to get, get from A to B. So there's there are speeding and uh, the Google Maps nowadays, if you press on how to go from A to B, it doesn't take you the, the nicest way. It takes you the quickest way. This has become one of those quickest ways from A to B. So it needs some attention. Questions? Thank you, Peter. I certainly appreciate your 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 time and your effort to come and bring these uh, things to our attention. Absolutely, and I'm sure Taps will make note of it. And uh, are there any questions for Peter? No. It sounds like you've described it very well, Peter. Uh, again, I appreciate your time and and thank you very much for coming and sharing the information with us. You too. Thank you. Um. Okay. Uh. Consent agenda. Are there any items in the consent agenda that require further discussion? Councillor Gregg. Thank you, uh, through you, Warden. The one item regarding ride sharing, just asked to uh, have that pulled. Okay, 6A. Anyone else? I'd entertain a motion to receive the balance of the consent agenda, Councillor Mackey and Councillor Carlton. All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. We will come back to that 6A later in the meeting, of course. Um, items for direction and discussion. The first is 7A, uh, Climate Change Initiatives Update. Uh, Rebecca Denard will be uh, giving this report. Can I have a mover to uh, put this on the floor? Councillor Pringle, Councillor McKay. Rebecca, welcome. Thank you. Ah, I've got the mic this time. <laughs> there we go. It should be getting some slides up in a minute. Do we have the slide? Ah, there we go. Perfect. There we go. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today, Warden and Council. Uh, I've got a few uh, projects that the climate change team has been working on, and uh, just giving you some updates about those about those projects. So I've got a number of topics to cover today, and I thought we'd pause between each one so that you can ask any questions or make any comments uh, before we move on to the next topic. So starting off is our, our green development standards. Uh, as, as you know, we've been working with the counties of Dufferin and Wellington to create green development standards, uh, a tri-county approach to, to that project. Uh, and the idea is that we wanna reduce the effort of having each county or each lower tier municipality create their own standards, uh, which would you know be a lot of effort and you'd make things more difficult for the development industry trying to negotiate their way through many different 
sort of policies and, and programs. So we're looking to to create a standard approach that that will that will work for everybody. Uh, just to refresh on what are green development standards, there are a set of principles that, that guide sustainable development of communities in an established area. They have criteria that uh, incorporate um, that can be incorporated into local development proposals. Uh, and green development standards can be considered at at various levels of uh, of the development process. So at the building level, there's we can think about things like energy efficiency measures sustainable building materials uh, at the site plan level. It's things like stormwater infiltration, native and drought resistant plants. Uh, and then even at the neighborhood level, uh, sidewalks, crosswalks, and other uh, infrastructure that would support walkable and extra transportation in the community. So just a little update on where we're at with the project. Uh, we're um, wrapping up this visioning and learning uh, part of the project. So we have held uh, public meetings in Dufferin and in Wellington. The ones in gray are coming up next week. We've also held information sessions for municipal staff at uh, all of all of uh, the member municipalities. So we had one in each of the counties for, for municipal staff. And just yesterday, we held a, an industry and developer session to just to get them on uh, up to speed about what the project is and the goals and what we're planning to do. So very shortly, we'll be moving on to the next phase of the project where we're really looking for input from all of these groups to tell us sort of what, what kind of things that they want to see in the development standards, asking those uh, pointed questions really to solicit the feedback from the, those uh, stakeholders about what they, what they want to see going forward. Uh, we're also in the process of engaging Indigenous communities, asking them what, how, and if they want to be consulted on this and uh, sort of arranging individual processes with them to align with uh, sort of their um, standard procedures on, on consultations. So we're, once we've gathered all of this input, we'll be drafting the standards probably over the summer, and then we'll be bringing back uh, an initial draft to put first to those stakeholder groups so that they can um, provide input and see if uh, their um, their input is reflected in what, what we come up with. And uh, and then that will get further refined um, through through additional consultations with staff and with senior management, and then eventually we'll get back to presenting it all to, to you once everybody else has had a, had a good look at it. Uh, so throughout this process, we're really taking a, a balanced approach. Uh, so see there's some of the things that we're, we're, we're trying to um, sort of create the right, the right balance of. So probably some of these standards will be mandatory and some aspects will be voluntary, uh, which what is mandatory, what is voluntary, that is something we're, we're looking to get uh, input in from stakeholders. Uh, we also recognize that there may be communities that have different needs and priorities. So much as we would love to have sort of exactly the same thing in absolutely every place, we realize that maybe some needs uh, or there may be more beneficial to customize some aspects of the standards to meet individual community needs. Uh, similarly, the idea of having simple standards where it's, again, sort of one path forwards uh, would be simple, but we also recognize that if we could provide some options, that will provide some flexibility to people, but we would be introducing a little bit of complexity there because then we have sort of different, different paths to achieve the same kind of goals. Uh, we can look at a prescriptive approach to standards, so that's sort of dictating exactly what the, the bill needs to have um, versus a performance base. So you're looking at more like the targets that it needs to achieve. So both of those approaches are, are under consideration. Uh, and then finally, a tier-based approach. Uh, this is similar to how the building code works and that we have sort of a stepwise progression that we're looking to um, put some predictability into sort of what's coming next. Um, and then there's also some points-based systems where you sort of put out a lot of things that could could be good, and sort of ask people to pick and choose which ones are going to get uh, that they want to that they want to include. And those can also be um, sort of a hybrid of those two, where you have some tiers, and then you ask people to add a few extra uh, points on top of their of their tier to 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 go forward. So this is we're early stages. We're still uh, you know we're just sort of at the beginning of the listening process. So once we've really heard from people we'll be able to have a really better idea of where we're gonna land on some of these on these balancing questions. And then just an update on the codes acceleration fund. I did report on this in, in January. At that point, we were seeking approval to enter into an agreement with Enercan to receive this funding. We have now finalized that agreement. 
So this contribution will really help us. Uh, you can sort of see some of the outlined points here, but the main advantage I see of this is that we will have funding extended to uh, March of 2027, and this will allow us to hire a staff person. Once we have the standards drafted and everybody thinks it's a good idea, then we how do we put this in, in place? So we'll have a support person that will be in charge of that process and be able to work through some of the, the growing pains and um, to be the point person for that project. And so that we can get it facilitate implementation and really get get this sort of just built into everybody's normal normal course of events. We also get some some recognition events. So being able to celebrate the, the businesses and, and developers who really do a great job with this uh, is another aspect of that funding that's that's pretty exciting. And that I think, yeah, that's that's uh, my um, what I got to say about that one. So if there's I just pause if there's anything uh, anybody would like to ask or comment on on the green development standards. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there any questions or are there any questions on that particular part? Councilor, Ma Councilor Matrasov, please. Thank you. Through you, the warden. Um, so I understand from that layout that the that the development community, the construction community will have their chance in this next phase to provide input on what's what's doable and which ones will be in the voluntary versus the mandatory bucket. The question I have is, is what's the thought process in terms of educating, creating awareness about the options of when it comes to the volunt voluntary choices that homeowners make when they're doing additions or building so that they know what to ask the construction community. They know what to ask their general contractors about. What's the, how can we benefit from this, this process to make sure that we're reaching the people that might have to make decisions? And maybe that contractor hasn't thought of it or isn't maybe an advocate of it, but, but we, the homeowner needs to ask the questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so the green development standards, uh, really the, the principal place that those are applied are through site plan approvals. So if you're doing just a renovation, the green development standards uh, would not be enforced on those folks. Uh, but there are pathways to do this. Uh, we would certainly be providing some education uh, so that everything would be voluntary, right? So you can um, have apply standards voluntarily on those those buildings that aren't uh, don't require site plan approval. Uh, the Intercan funding actually also provides a lot of training and education pieces as well as some talent and business attraction. So we're going to be working with the you know folks like partners at Georgian College and to really educate builders about what do you got to do to build net zero? What do we need to do? How do we develop skills for solar feasibility assessments? So that we're bringing those people in that have that those skills and really helping to upskill the the current workforce here so that people know what they need to do uh, so that that developer would have the 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 wherewithal to to understand if the homeowner is asking for a net zero build that they would they would you know just put their net zero person on that build and the way they'd go um, rather than it sort of being like oh my goodness I don't know how to do this uh, situation as well as you know providing some education to to homeowners about about the benefits of of you know what you can do to your home and uh, you know we're looking at life cycle costs of of a of a home so a home that is built to a higher standards is going to be more more comfortable and more affordable to operate. So there is benefits to the homeowner in sort of pushing for those higher standards. Thank you. Uh, through you, the warden, as a follow-up, um, that, that's very much of what I, I'm, I'm hoping to hear because the number of, it, 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 the, the focus on making sure that what comes forward in the process of site plan development, et cetera, it's great that that's a big brush to paint, but all the smaller ways in which this, this can benefit so many of our homes when they get into a retrofit perspective, just knowing what's out there and what we can actually make use of. It might just, it might sound like, well, that's just one little house, but that's one little house here, there, everywhere. And that starts to add up. So thank you. CEO Wingrove, you had a comment. Thanks. And I just want to emphasize to all of you that, the work that uh, Rebecca and others are are doing to uh, through these consultations, I think, is going to be very, very useful and valuable information to come back to to this council. What we're hearing, like so many of these kinds of projects, where the devil is in the details, 
and there are a lot of players. The system is complex and there are, you know, organizations and, and entities in that whole development process that um, are at various stages of readiness to make the kind of changes that will be required to really get to where we want to go. And I think it's really important for council to hear that information and to understand what some of the challenges and roadblocks are right now. Maybe these become places for advocacy, or maybe it's just good to be aware of what's happening out there. So, you know, when you wonder why things don't happen as quickly as they might, we can all understand where some of those challenges are and what the timelines are likely to be for those challenges to be addressed. So all of that to say, the consultation part has been very interesting so far, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the information that comes out of those discussions. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Gregg. Uh, I was just somewhat related to that then when we're consulting. Um, and I'm not sure if we have the courage to go there or not, but are we marrying any consideration of the general home size? If we're going to talk about new builds only and not renovations, and we examine the landscape in today's realm, which is people building 3,800 or 4,500 square foot homes, as opposed to 1,100 square foot homes, which have a much significantly less um, carbon uh, emission and footprint as opposed to these Goliaths that are continuing to get built across the landscape. Uh, they're more expensive to heat. They come on larger property sizes. They consume more of the lot size than perhaps the smaller ones. Uh, have, have, are you considering any of that in your engagement? Or, I mean, some of it might be zoning. Uh, but if we're going to talk about green, uh, being green, are we going to get real serious? Because are we going to penalize the excessive consumption and size and scale that a lot of people are building a home for to maybe live half a year in it uh, or to service uh, two retired individuals as opposed to uh, 40, 50 years ago when these homes were uh, you know, facilitating a family size of five, six, seven or eight people in a much smaller home. So uh, just wondering how is that getting uh, considered as part of this whole process? Yes, I, I would say like any any and everything is is currently on the table up for discussion and and home size has come up uh, in our in our conversations. Uh, it's it's a bit tricky again because of the uh, the site plan situation. If it's less than ten units, it doesn't have to go through site plan currently. So if we're just doing one ginormous home, it doesn't go through the same regulatory process as a development with forty sort of normal land homes. Uh, so we're sort of trying to figure out where the mechanism of when, how could we, you know, put the green development standards in effect on on one of these sort of single builds, large, uh, large builds, and how how that would sort of intersect with with the with the permitting process. Uh, again, not wanting to hold up things unnecessarily with red tape and kind of just delay everything um, unnecessarily, but again, being able to address these some of these issues that are on these sort of really really out there uh huge huge individual houses anyone else on this one particular councillor mackey thanks mr warden through you good morning county council rebecca i'm just wondering where affordability is going to enter into the uh the balance in the equation you talked about some of the mandatory things so i mean stick frame housing right now is about 400 dollars a square foot so, you know, a modest home, a thousand square foot home, by the time you buy a lot, you know, you're up over five or six hundred thousand dollars for an entry house. Uh, will we get information back on what some of the mandatory requirements will add to that uh, four hundred dollars a square foot for consideration? Yes, absolutely. Uh, affordability is, is top of mind for this project. And uh, we certainly wouldn't want to be putting anything in the mandatory category that was going to be impose a significant burden on on the homeowners, on citizens. Uh, at the same time, I think we need to consider the life cycle costs of a home. If it costs a small amount more upfront, 
that may be offset by the the operating costs being significantly lower. So if the energy bills, the the ongoing upkeep are are less, then there may be worthwhile to put that initial investment in. Um, also, that it's way more efficient to put those measures in at the beginning rather than uh, having to retrofit a house to to sort of bring it up to potentially where we see the building code going in the future. So we're trying to get ahead of it and getting things that would um, build in, you know, build in a good a good structure to begin with rather than sort of trying to fix it afterwards. Councillor Dickert. Thank you, Warden Milton. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, looking at similar to Councillor uh, Mackey's uh, concerns with the mandatory side of things, how much input has the building community had in this? Uh, because Gray County tends to have a lot of smaller builders who are not necessarily represented by an association or something of that nature. And uh, when I look at mandatory requirements, it concerns me that, you know, we're going to go above and beyond the building code. How do we compete with neighboring uh, municipalities? Um, I, when I first started reading about this, I thought it was going to be more in the lines of the R2000 program. I'm going back quite a few years here, but it was, uh, you know, they had the great suggestions and, and builders could choose to build to that standard, but it wasn't mandatory. So, uh, you know, you get the concerns with how do we educate our building official staff in our local communities? Does this take the ability of our local community? Does, does it take the uh, opportunity for our local communities to to have their own set of standards type of things. So uh, that was, those were my concerns, Why? Uh, yeah, so a few, few points in there. Uh, for, firstly, yes, we absolutely are consulting with, with the development community. We just did our first information session for them uh, yesterday. There were about 40, 45 uh, individuals in attendance to that. And that was our opportunity to tell them about the project, getting their heads around what it is we're trying to do. Um, the next step will be to schedule some feedback sessions for them to participate in. So we will be asking those those types of questions about what they think uh, is feasible, what they think is desirable for this community. Uh, we could put, we are also considering doing some smaller focus groups. If we find that we're not in those larger sort of sessions, we're not reaching the people we need to reach or not hearing enough, then we we were considering doing some focus groups with some, some individuals uh, to really get the, their feedback. Uh, the question about going above building code is certainly not uh, something we would take lightly and uh, we are still working out where where that might land the the thing that we're we're trying to, to uh, communicate at this point is that there's a lot more to green development standards that are not covered in the building code because the building code is really just about the building whereas green development standards covers that lot level the neighborhood level these things that are not included in the building code which you know we may consider doing some mandatory things around things that are not mandatory because the building code just doesn't even cover things like the length of a block or whether it needs sidewalks or um, you know whether it should be cited in a biodiversity like a, a high biodiversity zone like there's a lot of different things that can that can come into green development standards that just aren't even addressed in, in the building code so yeah we're just trying to balance it out and nothing has been decided at this point uh we haven't um we're waiting to hear from people before we pick what what our suggestion is for what's mandatory and what is not I think uh, the overriding, uh, and I'll come to you, Councillor Debrin, the overriding message here, I think, is that we're in very early days, and there's a lot of consulting and a lot of questions and answers that need to be had before we put anything to paper uh, with the stamp done. Councillor Debrin. Thank you, Warden, and thank you, Rebecca. Uh, just listening to some of these ideas, and while we are in that consultation phase and trying to develop a plan forward, talking about those those houses that or the Goliath homes that we don't have site plan control over uh, if it's less than 10 units, but partnering with the development community, the building departments of the municipalities to perhaps develop a pamphlet of, okay, you're going to build this 3,800 square foot home on a two acre lot have you considered incorporating some voluntary green standards? And here are some ideas that could help make your home more efficient. If they can build a 3,800, they can afford a $3,800 build, 3,800 square foot build, I think they can incorporate and afford a few green 
green options. So just something to keep in mind that how we can work together and share the information once you've established some options. Thank you. All good points. Let's move on to the experimental acres. There we go. Uh, yeah, changing changing boxes here. So uh, this is a, a program that we're working with farmers to test and support new uh, experimental practices that would help with soil house uh, that soil health and carbon capture on farms. So this was a pilot that was developed by Guelph and Wellington uh, through the Our Food Futures program. Um, Wellington facilitated the program in 2022 and 2023, uh, and Gray participated uh, in has participated in one year of this program. Uh, now the Our Food Futures funding is now uh, finished, so we had decided to take on the program ourselves, and we are working with Gray Ag Agricultural Services to deliver the program. Uh, and this program includes financial support of up to $3,000 per farm, plus some soil testing and networking opportunities. Uh, and this program is really one of the only things we're doing at the moment to support the capacity building in sustainable agriculture, which is identified as one of the pillars of our climate action plan. So uh, the application intake was uh, during the month of February. It was promoted to farmers through uh, postings on the website, social media, and at Great Bruce Farmers Week. Uh, the applications were evaluated anonymously using a scoring matrix by Gray Ag staff as well as Great County staff. We received 18 applications and we selected six uh, for participation. So here are some, these are the, the, uh, the selected projects for this year. As you can see, there's a, a mix of geography. We've got uh, farms in Chatsworth and in West Gray and uh, Gray Highlands. Uh, we've got small farms, we've got large farms. We have a number of different types of, of projects, uh, interseeding, silvopasture, uh, some liquid manure application. Uh, and then there's one project that's uh, just ongoing testing from, from last year, which is the bale grazing sheep, which we're just going to uh, continue to test for uh, the, the soil results on that one. Because obviously soil results take a long time to actually to see a difference in the testing. So we're hoping to, to be able to show more of a trajectory with that ongoing ongoing work on that one. Uh, so yeah, so those are the uh, farms that we're doing. And I, oh yeah, so next steps, uh, we're gonna be having some initial meetings with each of the participants just to confirm the details of their project where with the site and just finalizing agreements with each farmer. And then over the season, uh, the Greg services staff will be conducting meetings and farm visits with the with the uh, with the farmers, uh, doing those testings, getting uh, some insights onto how how are things going, uh, sort of that running the experiment part of the experimental acres, uh, and then at the end um, we'll be profiling these pictures. We'll be getting the results. We'll be sharing them out. Uh, the idea is that if if they we get a farm to test something, this is a hopefully will be an inspiration for other farmers to employ some of the similar practices with, they see their neighbors doing this successfully in the, in a, a local way. Uh, that's what farmers sort of need to sort of take the plunge and to try something new. So the idea is we start small and then hopefully some of these practices will kind of move more into the mainstream of, uh, of agricultural practice uh, in our community. So that's, uh, that's that one. Any questions on that one? It's always fun to look over the fence and see what the neighbor's doing without letting the neighbor know that you're actually looking over the fence. Don't see any questions on that one, so let's move on to the uh, community outreach and engagement program. That's okay. Sorry, I always forget. Yeah, all good. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, this... Uh, as the word mentioned, we have an outreach and engagement program uh, related to our climate adaptation plan. So developing a climate adaptation plan was identified as one of the next steps of going green and gray. Uh, the current plan we have is largely focused on uh, climate mitigation. So this is to slow the progress of climate change by reducing our emissions and sequestering carbon. A climate adaptation plan, which we don't yet have, is outlines how the community is going to respond to the impacts of climate change that are already baked in. So these are things that we know based on emissions that have already happened, these are gonna be 
how we predict our community is going to change, and we would like to have a plan to to address those. So it could include things like uh, uh, local climate models, risk and vulnerability assessments, uh, and actions that we could take as a community to uh, negate the negative impacts of, of climate change. Uh, we are planning to work with this uh, milestone process. It was created by ICLE Canada, who also worked on our, our climate mitigation plan. It's called the Building Adaptive and Resilient Communities Milestone Process. And this has been used by over 120 other municipalities. So it's uh, tried and tested. Uh, I know the text is extra small there, but you, you have it in, in your report. But basically we take, uh, you know, we initiate a plan, we do some research, we make a plan, implement the plan, and then we monitor and review and make sure that uh, everything's going um, according to the plan. So we have an opportunity to work with the Ontario Resource Centre for Climate Adaptation, which is a project at Ipley Canada. They recently launched a community outreach and engagement program, which provides cohort style learning and capacity support for Ontario municipalities. Uh, who are working on climate adaptation focused engagement. Uh, and that first milestone of the BARC process is really about engaging stakeholders and really gaining an understanding of, of what uh, who's who are the players at the table. So that's how we're going to be using this this uh, this project. So over the course of one year, uh, roughly from March uh, of this year to February of next year, we are going to be receiving support from ORCA team members. This includes capacity building, subject matter experts, workshops and lecture style presentations, tools and resources, connections and networking. Uh, and there's no monetary uh, cost to associate in this program. We we applied and we were accepted and we get to do this um, you know, as a, as a free exchange of, uh, of resources. So our, our adaptation initiative uh, we're going to be engaging uh, with our key audiences. That will include certainly staff at, at member municipalities, conservation authorities, public health, uh, indigenous communities, the agricultural community, uh, and various community groups uh, and youth groups that would have a stake in, in our climate adaptation planning. Uh, also, this work will in, involve uh, assembling existing research data and plans because we have done work that is adjacent to this work. We have an emergency management plan, Conservation areas have done a lot of uh, work on flood flooding mapping, and so, but we need to we need to find out what's out there. What are the gaps? How do we pull this all together into an adaptation plan? Uh, we'll also be preparing an application for FCM's local leadership for climate adaptation. This funding program is supposed to launch in uh, in the spring of this year, uh, and we will we'll be putting in an application. Uh, and we have matching funds already allocated in in the budget so that we can uh, put forward an application. For this for this program, we'll also be uh, hosting some stakeholder workshops, uh, and this this work roughly corresponds to the beginning of milestone one up to the beginning of, of milestone three, where we sort of are setting a vision and goals uh, of the plan uh, as we finish this bark process, uh, this orca process, the year the year long, and uh, we anticipate completing the Q, uh, community climate adaptation plan either late 2025 or early 2026. And uh, certainly if we are successful with our FCM application, this will allow us to uh, increase the scope and deliver more quickly on that, on that adaptation plan if we get uh, additional resources to do it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's that one. Any, any thoughts or questions on that one? Okay, carrying on. Uh, Green Economy Hub. So this is a uh, this is a project that's been circulating in the community for for quite a while. Maybe I'll just go back and uh, give some basics about what is a green economy hub. So green economy hubs are organizations that are supported by an organization called Green Economy Canada, and they engage local businesses in taking climate action. They use a cohort report cohort approach to work with local business to set and achieve sustainability targets. They bring together support and celebrate businesses as they achieve those goals. Uh, hubs have a very different, uh, there's some different organizational principles, but they have some, some core approaches. They're community led, business focused, revenue generating and target driven. They're usually operated by a local environmental nonprofit who would provide services for a fee to the local business community. Uh, but there are other uh, operation models as well that uh, have been used. 
The services are really geared for small, medium enterprises who don't have, usually don't have sustainability experts on staff, but have a strong business case for sustainability within their operations. A green Economy Hub really can strengthen the local green economy by providing education and creating demand for sustainable goods and services. Uh, there are currently eight hubs in Canada, six of which are in Ontario, and Great Bruce is the only region in southern Ontario that is not currently covered by uh, service by a local hub. So there has been a local, local working group who's been uh, addressing this, this, this issue. They've uh, been talking about this since uh, 2021. Uh, and then the Institute of Southern Georgian Bay hosted an event uh, in 2023 uh, called Achieving Sustainability Through the Greener Economy. And following this, uh, a working group was formed. It includes uh, representatives from Gray County, which is me, uh, the town of Blue Mountains, the town of Collingwood, the Institute for Southern Georgian Bay, RTO7, the Blue Mountain Resort, McLean Engineering, uh, Climate Action Now, Georgian Bay Forever, Wasaga, Wasaga Climate Action Team, and uh, Collingwood Climate Action Team. So there's quite a cross um, sectoral support on this. Uh, we've got municipalities, nonprofits, uh, business organizations, as well as uh, actual businesses on, on this committee. So the next step for this group is to seek some broader engagement from the business community to better understand their needs for sustainability. Uh, they're hosting a sustainability summit at the town of Moo Mountains on April 25th, and this is an opportunity we're going to um, have a business audience, and Green Academy will, Canada will present, uh, and we will engage with those businesses in some facilitated discussion to gauge their interest and their, their needs for uh, sustainability services. Uh, so one potential um, future pilot initiative for this, for this project is to have a pilot uh, cohort of local businesses that would join the national hub. So the Green Economy Canada currently has a hub that uh, any business in Canada can join. If they if there isn't a local hub, they can join this national hub. Uh, this would allow the businesses locally to immediately start their sustainability journey with services delivered by Green Economy Canada while enjoying the benefits of a local network. So, the, so there would be some local events and, and local specific things that would happen in the community, but some of the services would also be delivered naturally. And this would lay the groundwork for a local hub to fully launch uh, in this in this area, if this pilot is successful, it would lay the groundwork for for a fully fledged uh, local hub. So, what's what's our role in all this? Uh, the Green Economy Hub is uh, a community led initiative. So, the recommendation is that we continue to participate in this working group, uh, attend, uh, assisting with convening and facilitating meetings of stakeholders to understand the feasibility and potential of this project. Uh, we'll continue to outreach and engage with colleagues to inform them about the Green Economy Hub and through our economic development department, uh, reach out to businesses to understand their needs for sustainability and the potential they see uh, if they're potentially interested in joining this hub and uh, and moving this forward. Uh, and just on a personal note, I, I'm excited to be presenting about this because prior to my role here, uh, I ran the Green Economy Hub in Sudbury. So I have some really direct personal experience about this. So if uh, there's any sort of questions, I have uh, possibly a little more background knowledge than than the average on uh, on this particular project. So uh, happy to share it with you today. And that's uh, that's that one. Any questions on that particular one? Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Gordon. Rebecca, help me understand. I think I heard you say there are six hubs in Ontario and Gray and Bruce is the only area not served. So those other six hubs must be have a big geographic area. There we go. Yes. So uh, the uh, it's really in um, north, in southern Ontario. So there's a Green Economy North, which is the one I ran in Sudbury, it serves all of northeastern Ontario. The part that's missing, the the big chunk around Thunder Bay, is currently not yet served by a hub. So anything sort of west of Sault Ste. Marie in the north um, area is currently not served. Uh, but the sort of anything from you know Perry Sound south is covered by by one of the hubs, and they have rather large uh, geographies. And the the idea behind that was that they started really as community based uh, organizations, but then there was demand for someone who's sort of just across the border, and they wanted to participate. And uh, at first, the answer was like, no, this is only for people 
in Waterloo Region or only for people in the city of London. And then somebody else would say, well, I really want to do this. Where can I go? So the answer to that was to firstly expand the geography of those local hubs to try and cover off more of the province and to launch this national hub for people, say, in Winnipeg or Halifax or Saskatoon, who really wouldn't have it wouldn't make sense for any of those to be served by a local hub. So they're, yeah, they're just sort of bringing, bringing the, trying to get the coverage um, in the area. Thanks, Mr. Ward. So help me understand why we would need to create one here if we couldn't just expand the border of one to this, you know, for Southwestern Ontario. Why couldn't Southwestern Ontario have a hub so there's not duplication? So we, we think that there's a, a uniqueness about our our area and a real sense of community in this in this area that that the other hubs are not necessarily well positioned to serve. Uh, probably the, the bordering hubs, uh, there's one in uh, York region that's run out of the Windfall Ecology Center. Uh, they're they're focused on sort of large urban centers. Uh, then to the south, there would be a, a hub out of Waterloo uh, who are really sort of focused on that tech sector, Waterloo region type um, businesses. There's one out of Peterborough that may more align, but they're quite a bit further east than us. So we really see the potential of having something uh, local because part of this is a, a local recognition and a local networking opportunities. So we would love to be able to connect the businesses of Bray Bruce and and that, that sort of chunk of Simcoe that's uh, this side of Barry. In, in events and, and ways to, to come together. So if, if we're trying to bring people together for a networking event, we're, we don't want to be sort of sending them all off to Waterloo or to London or to uh, to York region to, to do that. We really see the value of having that local, that local piece. And this is what sort of differentiates this program from some other programs that are more sector-based. This one is really focused on local and how can we, how can local businesses support and grow that green economy in the local in the local context. Just you want to follow up? Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Warden. So in the report we said Gray and Bruce. So has there been um conversations with Bruce County? Where do they sit on all this? So the, the players currently at the table are more centered around that Southern Georgian Bay region because that's where we've started the work. Uh, the, the approach, following this report, the outreach to, to Bruce will, will begin. I wanted to be able to bring this to, to your attention before I'm kind of putting my staff time out there and, and really starting to talk about it to colleagues uh, in, other, in other places. So this is, the, this is the sort of initiation point of that additional outreach. Uh, now, the thought for developing a hub, it really makes sense to start in sort of a center and then expand again. So we may we may look at Bruce as like a phase two uh, for really heavily promotions of this program. But that being said, if there was a business in, if we get a hub going and there's a business in Bruce that really wants in, absolutely, we would be most welcome to come in. But we need to sort of focus our communications and our efforts sort of at, in sort of an expanding circles uh, that's certainly what we did in, in Sudbury. We started in Sudbury and expanded to Manitoulin and then to Northeastern Ontario. So just because of the resources, um, this is generally run by a nonprofit who doesn't have the capacity to be everywhere at once all the time. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Rebecca. Councillor Gregg and then Councillor Hutchison. Thank you and through you, Warden. Uh, I have some hesitancy on, on the green economy hub in that, uh, I'm a little concerned that this is originating from an outfit, not an outfit. There's not not for profits. There's lots of good organizations, and uh, sometimes they're predicated upon join our organization. I know I, there's a hyperlink in here for hotels. There are uh, rooms one to ten. It costs you six hundred dollars to join. Eleven to twenties, nine hundred, whatever. So. When I look at this, I have to be convinced there's value that is and and definable or measurable outcomes. And it's not just joining an organization for X amount of dollars and there's going to be more networking and more um, handshakes and slap on the backs and, and saying how good you are doing. Because that's on the surface. That's what this really feels like. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing what measurable outcomes came out of Sudbury. 
because I, I, I'm hesitant to get too far outside here and everything we're doing into the community and not focusing on the county of Gray and our own corporate in, in, uh, footprint. Um, a lot of these items, and, and we'll go back to farming. Farming, I think, is a perfect example and the sustainable agricultural, but are we realizing the advances that probably the warden with his equipment in today's realm from 40 years ago when the farmer would go over the field with a, a 10 foot, uh, you know, if you plow it, you disc it, you cultivate it, you cultivate it, you plant it, you harrow it. And now you look at the advances that John Deere and Case have made. So it's big money, it's corporations that drive the advances and the green economy is advancing whether we know it or not. So uh, I just wonder like, how involved are we with just the networking and not actually realizing that big corporations are actually making significant impacts. Um, and we're wandering into something here that we don't have the resources or the ability to achieve. I think if we go if we go back to the, the content of the report, and I think the important point to remember here is that the Green Economy Hub is a community-led initiative. And this is part of our, this work is part of the climate change action plan that this council adopted. It's one small part of it. Um, staff's role here is one about facilitation and raising awareness and providing assistance where that assisted is, is needed and welcomed. Uh, I don't think there's anything here that where we're trying to um, force any anything on anyone, um, but I'll, and Rebecca, you can. Sure. Yes. Happy to happy to think about that. So the county's role is that networker and convener of uh, of the network just to spread the word. But the actual hub itself has very concrete deliverables and targets. Every business that joined makes a GHG inventory. They make an action plan. They set a public target that they're looking to achieve. Uh, so there's, and that's reported on on an annual basis. So it it doesn't fall into that greenwashing category where they say they're doing all kinds of green stuff and we don't actually see any evidence that that is actually happening. And it, it can provide, the, the businesses do it because there's a business case for it. And that can be in, the ter in, in terms of uh, energy savings by making their business more efficient. Uh, employee engagement, everybody wants to work for somebody who's doing their part, has that ESG framework um, lens to their operations. Uh, the value of a green brand. So so the consumer can see that this business that I'm supporting is is aligned with my values. So that's the that's the reason a business joins. They don't join unless they have that kind of business case for for why they're spending money and resources to do this. And our role is really just to present this as an option to businesses. If you if this seems like something that you would be interested, that you would find beneficial to your operations, here's an opportunity to join some others and to learn about it and to to involve, uh, get involved with this local hub. And if it's not for you, you know, carry on, move on down the road. Nobody's forcing anybody to be part of this. Councilor Hutchison. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Maybe you've sort of answered some of this, but I'm just curious that in here, they talk about the, um, the hub has four approaches, community-led, business-focused, revenue-generating, and target-driven. I'm just wondering, you said you have experience from previous working with a hub. Can you give us an example of uh, a project that maybe would fit into this category and, and uh, that maybe had success? Thank you. So just, just to clarify, a project that a business has undertaken to uh, as a member of the hub? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we had a member... Uh, they were a brewery on Manitoulin Island called Split Rail Brewing, and they were trying to figure out if they should continue to put their beer in bottles or put their beer in cans, which was more expensive, which was more GHG neutral, because on Manitoulin, they had to bring in a bottler. Uh, they had to had like they had to drive the equipment up the highway every time they wanted to bottle their beer. So the, the, the pros and cons of, of doing that and the, the hub was able to help them work through that that problem presenting the pros and cons and the, the environmental impact of both of those scenarios and it led them to make a switch in their operations so now that they they now switched over to putting their beer in cans which is more ghg effective because they don't have to bring in their bottler they were they invested in a canner 
that they could have on site all the time so they didn't have to bring in that equipment. And, and it's actually cheaper and easier to ship cans than bottles because of the breakage and the, the weight of the shipping is also a, a GHG factor in terms of how much uh, emissions are caused by shipping this beer around here, there, and everywhere. So that's just sort of an example. And they are very small operations. You know, they have four or five people. They don't have capacity for someone to do that kind of work. Uh, but as a member of the hub, we were able to sort of help them through that process. Leave it to Wes Gray to get us talking about beer. Okay. All right. Um, any last words, Rebecca, or is that it? I, I think we've, we've had a good discussion about this one. I know uh, probably a couple people, uh, myself included, looking for a recess. So thank you, Rebecca, very much. A uh, lot of information there. So we'll look forward to how things are going in the future. All right. Thank you. All right. It's 20 after 11. Let's reset. Oh, yeah. We need to vote. Sorry. All those in favor. That is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, it's 20 after 11. Let's recess until 1130.
One minute warning. Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. First report now, or the next report rather, is a uh, 2023 year-end transfers. And Sue Murray is here to speak to this one. Someone care to move this motion? Councillor Mackey and Councillor Deckard. Welcome, Sue. The floor is yours. Thank you and um, good morning, everyone. So currently we are just finalizing our 2023 year end. Our auditors are actually currently on site just on the other side of that door over there. They'll be with us for a few weeks and then not anticipating any issues, but it's that time of year for us. March is a very busy year for finance. So the report before you um, is a report outlining the estimated surplus and deficits that we have within our departments for the year ending 2023. As I've mentioned, the auditors are next door, and when they're done, we will be bringing back a full audited report and a presentation to the Budget and Finance Committee, expected to be in June. So overall, the Gray County is estimating that we will have just over a $1.8 million surplus for the year, and it's sort of broken down within our four corporate functional areas that you see above you on the screen. Our corporate services is projecting a 784300 surplus Planning and community development, 77,000 surplus. Our human services department, 653,500. And our transportation services has 288,000. To put that 1.8 million into perspective, it represents about a 2.35% of our current levy dollars for 2023. And if you compare it to our actual budgeted expenses of 225 million, it's about a 0.8% of our budgeted overall expenses. If council will recall back in 2021, staff determined that it was advantageous to pay off the balance of the Golden Town Mortgage. And at this time, we have a balance of $887,559.57, which is currently shown as unfinanced on our balance sheet. The intent in 2020 was, 2021 was to repay ourselves over a period of time and reduce borrowing costs. Based on the surplus we have this year, staff are recommending that this amount be repaid using funds that have been transferred to the one-time funding reserve. If this transfer is done, it will leave us with just over $4.5 million in our one-time uh, funding reserve. Based on the reserve policy that you have attached on the report, we have sort of set out in that policy a minimum, maximum, and a target balance in that reserve, which is based on certain percentages of our levy. Once that um, 887,000, it will be withdrawn from the reserve. It leaves us with just a little over 4.5 million. And that 4.5 million actually just shy of our target balance. It's about 221,000 less than our target balance. So that leaves us in good shape going forward for our next budget years. So you will see in the chart sort of in the, in the report that shows where we, um, based on these four areas where the reserves, um, which sort of deeper functional departments and where the reserve transfers will be going um, in columns three and four. Um, the, the, the last column is the amount that of the projected surplus or deficit. And then the second column is sort of which reserve 
and which area has sort of originated this surplus or deficit amount. So for example, in our corporate service area, I did mention that we had a $784,300 surplus. Overall, um, we're recommending that 20,000 go to a finance reserve. If council will recollect when our budget discussions, we had hoped to put $20,000 in a finance reserve and we removed that transfer in our budgets. So we're, we said we would try to put it in with surplus this year. So that's why you see the 20,000. Um, there was some overall corporate services within our admin base and our property budgets and our supplemental taxes and write-offs uh, were 529,000. You will see that there is uh, more detail within our, our written narrative. So I'm just gonna try to highlight quickly sort of the main uh, drivers for either surpluses or deficits. Within our admin departments, which cover multiple departments, um, there is approximately $514,000 in surplus, which is driving mainly between staffing vacancies and just gapping throughout the year that naturally occurs. And you will actually see this as a theme kind of that runs through some of our departments throughout the year, budget best as we can. And as soon as you set the budget, life circumstances can change those very quickly. Council has approximately 38,700 in surplus dollars, uh, mainly due to travel and meals being lower than expected. Our IS budget is um, does have a deficit of about 127,000. Um, they did mid-year make some decisions on Microsoft, Microsoft licensing that put that budget over balance, but I will caveat that when the discussions were happening, we were well aware of the salary gappings that we knew that they also had in their IT budget, which falls under our administration line. So it looks like it's over, but we knew that when it happened and decisions were made based on what was best for Great County. Our property budget has a slight surplus of 68,000, uh, mainly due to snow removal and utility savings in the year. Our POA department has a surplus of $191,000, mainly due to um, expected ticket revenue being higher than expected. I do know there was one large ticket that was received that dated back to the 1990s, but I don't have that exact amount on hand with me right now, but I know that was the driver of some of that. So you just never know with your POA when the ticket revenue could come in, but there was a larger one than normal. Our subs and write-offs have a $529,800 surplus. This, this, These subs and write-offs can vary significantly from year to year, so we budget as best we can based on the knowledge we have, but as you will see in your lower tiers, it can vary from year to year. Um, the health unit, we had a, a slight deficit there, 57000 more of a timing difference when we set our budget and they set theirs. Our WSIB um, department has a deficit of 348,300. This just goes down to the number and duration of claims during the year. It's sort of similar to the subs and write-offs. Staff do their best every year based on historical and things happen throughout the year out of our control. Our weekly indemnity had a small surplus of 44,000 and we had some 66,000 uh, deficit in some of our capital projects. Um, some of it was capital projects that were sort of carried forward and some dollars that sometimes you make those decisions on when you think projects will happen. So some of those expenses flowed more into this year than we thought because they didn't have to fall within the 2022 year end. In our planning and community development um, functional area, we are estimating a total uh, surplus overall of 77,000. Um, civic addressing and agricultural and forestry and trails, they sort of fall under what we more call planning or group with planning. So they have a total surplus of 29,000. Um, civic addressing, the main differences there were less expenses on signages and pur purchase services. In agricultural, we had a $15,000 less in purchase service and other minor variances and expenses, but I will caveat as well that we do know there was about a $9,200 of AP credits that related to a prior year that happened after the year end was finalized. So even though it looks larger, it's it's a bit of a year end mix. And Forest Region Trails had a very minor um, overage in one of their bridging culvert works, 500. 
Active in tourism has an overall surplus of 48,000. Um, 42.5 is in the operating and there's a 5,500 surplus in the capital fund. Their, their operating um, surplus mainly drives from salaries and benefits, about 37,000. Small surplus in the Sydenham of 5,500, um, more rent. They were able to fill the rooms a little bit more and I think they had a little bit less on utilities. And their capital budget was just less on church and tourism signage than they expected. And gray routes overall didn't have a surplus or deficit, but it was a mix between operating and capital. They had staff vacancies in their operating fund that created about $40,000 surplus, but in their capital, they had the, um, the roof, the flat roof replacement that went over budget. So together they netted to zero and you were, uh, there was a report during the year on that flat roof replacement. Our human services um, projected surplus and deficit overall is about 653,500. There's many departments within human services. So I'm gonna try to highlight this as best I can. So social services has a projected surplus of 57,300. Housing has a projected surplus of 32,900. And if I can combine all of the long-term care budgets, they had an overall surplus of 246,300 and our paramedic services has a projected deficit of 197,000. Within our social services um, brackets, we have two main budget areas, our Ontario works in early learning and childhood. The Ontario Works, we have more staff vacancies in there, about 154, and there were just other just general savings on their training, office supplies, and Ontario Works stability program. In the early learning and childhood um, budgets, there was 343,400 in surplus. Um, some of this arises from the early on budgets, about 128,900. And the remaining surplus was based on some traditional funding that they were able to use. And overall within our housing portfolio, there was a $39,000 surplus, but it sort of has, this one has some larger swings of surpluses and deficits within their budgets. So in the homelessness and prevention program in the first three years of this year, which we're well aware of the, the needs that we've had in, in this area, they had a, a deficit of 427,000 in the first three months of this year. Our admin and property budgets were in a deficit position of about 34,600, um, mainly in building repairs and utilities uh, were offset somewhat by savings and property taxes and tenant revenues. Um, the 14th street building um, was, didn't get to occupancy as early as we had anticipated. So there was a deficit there of 19,800. And nonprofit housing, we had a surplus of 332,900, mainly due to agreements and mortgages ending mid-year, as well as excess subsidy, subsidies being repaid by providers resulting from their annual information returns. And the nonprofit housing capital, we had a surplus of 181,400. Basically, we received some provincial funding during the year that was unexpected, and those were levy funded projects. So that's what created that. Um, and once, and then we'll switch, talk about our long-term care. Our long, overall, our long-term care has um, some small operating deficits, really hard to identify specific larger ones within their operating budgets. And their capital budgets are, are in a surplus position mainly because they received um, capital funding throughout the year that was not anticipated as well. And within our paramedic services a budget, you do see $197,000 of, of deficit there. Um, the bulk of that is going to come from $132,000 in, in salaries and benefits over it. Mainly can be attributed to um, the training, increased training for new paramedics. So staff budget had budgeted based on two new hires in the year, and we actually had 22. So that 
because they're a 24 seven operation, new staff tra training and stuff. 10? Did I say 10 new hires? Two. And their vehicle ops, there was um, increases in, in the aging fleet. So they had its deficit of 39,200. Um, and medical supplies, which I think you've heard about tr throughout the year, was in a deficit position of 92200 But on the plus side, they did receive some additional revenues from the province and expected of about 80000 And in our transportation department, you will see that overall they had a $288,000 surplus, of which there was a deficit in the operating of 353700 and a capital surplus of 641700 um, The operating deficit is mainly attributed to stock usage that, throughout the year. And we did, um, staff had anticipated pulling in some money in reserves in the year, but knowing that they had some larger capital surpluses, they didn't bring that money in because we knew eventually it would all fall through into the their general capital reserve. And there were two main projects within the capital that created that surplus, which um, was Gray Road 7 and, and Gray Road 18 projects. And also one other thing that we need to highlight within the year and transfers report are the donations that we receive throughout the year um, need to go into their own special reserve in our transfers. So Gray Gables, Lee Manor, Rockwood Terrace, and Gray Roots all received donations this year. And that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Sue. Are there any questions? Councillor Gray. Better ask a question. Uh, thanks for the report, Sue. Uh, I've got three questions. How does 1.8 million compare to uh, the surplus deficit of perhaps the last four or five years in just a general term? So I'm not worried about specifics to the dollar. Um, secondly, we do have the structured new budget and finance committee now. So these reserve contributions that are recommended by staff, would they support the opportunity for subsequent reductions in the 25 budget preparation or are these reserve contributions largely going to reserves outside of our normalized uh, budgetary reserve contributions, in which case the actual savings, the taxpayers already paid for these, uh, has already expended these funds. So uh, I guess if there is some alignment to what we are normally uh, placed into those reserves, there's opportunity for that future reduction from the obligation. and. You you know you can't go wrong with contributing to the reserves. You can have too much in reserves and double tax essentially. Um, but once they're in the reserve, sometimes they be, they can get easy to spend um, or easier to spend. So I guess that's second question. Third question is uh, maybe twelve months ago we had some opportunities uh, from the county where we were trying to support housing initiatives. And I think the one federal program was the housing innovator fund and it didn't come through with the funding um, that we were hopeful of. So uh, I guess I'm wondering if staff considered, uh, we know that housing is a priority in Gray County. It's a $1.8 million fund was there consideration or should there be consideration to leveraging some of this $1.8 million to uh, finance and support uh, needed housing uh, that's in within the county? Thank you. Those are very good questions. I might need Mary Lou's help on the first one with prior years because I don't have that information on the tip of my desk. I can answer the second one. So yeah. I, what we do is we look and hopefully when we get into the budget and finance committee, we'll be able to show you more detail. Currently right now we look, I got staff looking at like a 10 year lens in our reserves. So what's, what's the magic number we should be keeping in our reserves, which is why you'll see sometimes a constant transfer to reserve. And so every year we look at that, what's the next 10 years going to look like? Do we have enough based on what some reserves have very specific reserve, you know, 
targeted balances. So what does that look like in a 10 year? So yeah, it's not meant to just keep building and building. The reserves are there to help guide us in a future needs so that we don't see highs and lows in our tax rates, it's more stabilizing it. So yeah, definitely, we definitely look at that. And I hope we can bring some of that actual 10 year lens to that committee and more right now it's next, it's in a, not a pretty format. So I would like to get that to that committee for sure, because that is guides us in a lot of decisions. And I know Scott can relate to this because I helped him guide him through some planning due to staff vacancies we had in our department. So yeah, looking at that 10 year lens, like what do you need and how much do we need to keep putting towards those reserves? And every, cause every year we get changes based on pricing, costing. Sometimes we take projects off the 10 year capital list or gone or even just operating needs. So yeah, it's definitely not just meant to go in there and build forever because that's not a good use of our taxpayers' dollars either. And the third one, I can't, I don't think this, Anne-Marie's, I think we might have to get back to you on that third question, because I don't particularly have that level of detail with me right now. Thank you, Sue. Did Mary Lou, were you going to speak to the first question? Or, sorry, I did not trying to rush you, but... I think it's probably easier if we circulate that information after the meeting. I was just doing a quick look and I'd have to make sure that this ties to the financials. Uh, it shows that in 2022, our surplus was just shy of 1.6 million and 2021, and that's as far as I managed to get going back through, showed 363,100. Um, so I can provide that information and we can circulate it after. Okay, that would be appreciated. Uh, CAO Wingrove. Thank you. Um, you'll note even in this report, there are um, you know a significant amount, half of, of um, what we're looking at here comes from either supplemental taxes or WSIB. And, and both of those things where we have the ability to try and be on top of those numbers or forecast them accurately. There are aspects of this that are very much out of our control. And so that does contribute to uh, where we're seeing. As far as the the housing money, as you know, Anne-Marie is um, currently working on an updated 10-year housing and homelessness plan. We do have some projects that are um, underway. There's also been some recent changes to how um, federal and provincial money might be available to um, make those happen. But right now, I think our performance suggests that we're working on somewhere in excess of $400,000 a unit if we were going to build a new somewhere. So it, it really does take a, you know, a significant investment to make us any kind of a substantial build viable. Any other questions? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you, Sue. And don't go away because I think you have the next report as well, and it's regarding the asset retirement policy. Someone care to move that, please? Councillor Keaveny, Councillor Council Patterson. Sue. I will not be speaking to this report. I would like to introduce one of our financial analysts, Matt Hukiam. He joined us last May and has been a great addition to our team. And I think you've heard enough from me today. So Matt is definitely more of an expert in this area than I am. So I'll let you hear from Matt today. We're very happy to have him as a winner. Welcome, Matt. Good to see you. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Sue, and good morning, County Council. So. As Sue mentioned, I'm going to talk about our ARO policy, which is our asset retirement obligation. Um, so I'm going to start off with just going to quickly go over what we're going to talk about today. So there's new PSAP standards, which is why we have to introduce this new policy. And I'll kind of explain why we are presenting this today. I'll then go into an explanation of what ARO's are, give a couple um, common um, ARO's that we have seen. And then lastly, and most importantly, how does this actually affect Gray County? So the new PSAP standard is PS3280, Asset Retirement Obligations. And this is basically a formal requirement that is um, being introduced so that we record um, the costs that additional costs that we'll have to incur for certain disposing of certain assets. 
Um, this is similar to a previous standard 3270, which was in regards to the landfills, but this kind of encompasses that and is an enhancement to uh, that standard to be more broad and cover more, more items. Uh, this standard was initially released in 2018, but is mandatory beginning fiscal years beginning on or after April 1st, 2022. So for Gray County, that means that the effective date is December 31st, 2023, which is the year end that um, we are working on right now with the auditors. So this is a standard that is applicable to all public sector organizations. So you'll see them within municipalities, as well as the school boards and hospitals, among other organizations like that. So what are arrows? So this is directly from the standard. Um, the criteria for an asset retirement obligation uh, means that there's a legal obligation to incur retirement costs in relation to a capital asset. A past transaction or event causing a liability has occurred. Expected future economic benefits will be given up and re a reasonable estimate of the amount can be made. So in terms that we can actually understand and that are useful for us in finance and hopefully a little more clear for you guys as well, is that there are certain capital assets that we have in the county that we have to incur an additional cost to dispose of. So this, this um, policy is in place to help us quantify these costs when it comes to account for them when we're disposing. So some of the examples that we have um, would be soil remediation, which we saw when we were removing the uh, underground um, fuel tanks in Clarksburg. So there was an additional cost that we had to spend to get rid of the um, contaminated soil. Additionally, in a lot of our housing units, if there's asbestos, there's an additional cost that we have to incur to safely dispose of it and make sure that it is disposed of properly. So a couple of examples, I've mentioned a couple of these already. So there's asbestos, um, underground fuel storage tanks, landfills, lead, and other building materials, wastewater treatment facilities. Those are kind of the, the main ones that we've been seeing in municipalities in our area and among the working groups we've been working with. So now the big important question is how to suspect Gray County. So through our discussion and investigations, we've determined that the only ARO that we will have to quantify is asbestos in some of our buildings. As I mentioned, we removed an in-ground fuel tank last year, and that was the last one that we had at Gray County, so we no longer have to worry about those for this um, reporting. And since asbestos is generally only a concern when it's disturbed, we only have to incur these costs when we're disposing of the asset, whether that's through a major renovation, um, specific items that we have to replace, or uh, larger scale renovations of buildings. So the reason that uh, we have to record this is basically there are additional costs that we have to incur. We have to have subcontractors hired hired so that they have the special training to dispose of asbestos safely and make sure that we're not spreading um, hazardous materials. So again, these the main thing with this policy is that these costs are not new things. This is something we've been doing in the past and this policy doesn't make it so that we're spending extra money. This policy is only in place to have a line on our financial statements that show in the future, we expect to spend this much on these remediation costs when it comes time to dispose of these um, items that we do. It's not actually extra money that we're spending. We would be spending it regardless of this policy. And then this last slide kind of outlines what finance has been working on. And uh, basically this policy is here to make sure that we collect the relevant information and we have created this policy to help provide us direction moving forward while working on AROs. It outlines the financial criteria for recognition and how we measure the estimated costs of the abatement and how the, we will be presenting the information in the financial statements. This is not just a one and done exercise. This is something that we'll have to continually do every year and we'll have to look at this policy and make sure that we're updating our numbers to be at accurately reflected in our financial statements, which is why we're bringing this policy so that we have the direction each year moving forward. Um, so there are discount rates and other items that we use in the policy, which we will be looking at every single year to make sure that they're still relevant and make sure that we are um, encompass encompassing any ARO that we might have in the county, whether it's buying a new building, we'll be making sure that we are inspecting it to see if there's anything we should be 
adding to our aero policy and on the other side as well, if we do any kind of abatement, we'll be removing it from our our estimated costs for um, for the aero. Um, so that is all I have for discussion on the aero policy. So I'll open the floor to any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, Matt. Are, are there any questions? <clears throat> not seeing not seeing any. I think it's fairly straightforward. All those in favor? That is carried. Thanks, Matt. Okay, we have uh, another report here, a final report regarding the uh, draft asset. No, wait, the county official plan amendment, 20. And I'm almost certain, given the time of the day, that Scott Taylor put Becky up to this. <laughs> but in any case, welcome, Becky, and the floor is yours. Yes, classic having the uh, planning report just before lunch. Yes, I need a mover and seconder. That's right. Councillor Carlton and Councillor Nielsen. Thank you. Okay, sorry for the delay on that. Um, just for everyone's benefit, my name is Becky Hillier. I am the Intermediate Planner with Gray County. Uh, I'm just going to be presenting very briefly, hopefully, <laughs> on the uh, County Official Plan Amendment Number 20, um, which is uh, proposed on the Dundalk Cemetery lands, and it uh, is a, a recapture of Report PDR-CW-1624. Uh, so the, the recommendations that we're looking for today uh, is to acknowledge that all written and oral submissions on official plan number 20 were considered and helped to make an informed recommendation and decision on this matter. Uh, that report PDR CW 1624 be received and that amendment number 20 to the Gray County official plan to permit the redesignation of rural and hazard lands to primary settlement area for the purposes of permitting future residential sorry, future residential development on a portion of lands legally described as part of Lot 229, Concession 3, southwest of the Toronto Sydenham Road and the geographic township of Proton, being part one of reference plan 16R 8057, now in the township of Southgate, be supported and a bylaw to adopt the county official plan be prepared for consideration by county council. Uh, so just to provide a brief uh, background of the proposal, uh, this OPA was submitted by the Township of Southgate. They're the applicants for the proposal. Uh, and the application pr to proposes to redesignate about 0 0.87 hectares or 2.15 acres of land from the rural and hazard lands designation to the primary settlement area designation. So it would be effectively expanding the settlement area of Dundalk by 0 0.87 hectares, so a relatively small amount. Um, the subject property is locally known as the Maple Grove Cemetery. Um, the entirety of that property is about 5.6 hectares in size, um, but the portion subject to the, to the uh, application today is only that 0 0.87 hectares. Um, the southern part portion of the cemetery is actively used for cemetery purposes, uh, but the portion we're speaking about today, uh, which is part of the northern portion, uh, is vacant and unused at this time. The lands currently straddle the settlement area of Dundalk. Um, and so, as I said, the effect would be to slightly expand the area of Dundalk. In terms of the surrounding land uses, so we see the uh, subject property here in yellow. Um, the, as you can see, the, the lower portion of the property, the southern southeastern portion, is actively used for that cemetery, but it's the portion to the north 
uh, kind of in that field area at the top that we're, we're discussing today. Um, I'd just like to point out, uh, you can see the, the lands to the north of the subject property uh, bordered in that red line. Uh, those lands were subject to um, approval by the province for a minister's zone, zoning order uh, in 2022. And so uh, that property received zoning permission for a residential subdivision. Um, and it's my understanding that the township plans to uh, surplus uh, the, the, the portion of the property that we're talking today uh, as part of the cemetery lands and to merge that property in future with that MZO property. And in exchange, the township would receive um, some additional lands further along Gray, Gray Road 9, um, part of that MZO property for the purposes of establishing uh, a community services facility or hub. Um, some surrounding la uh, land uses just to be aware of, uh, it's mostly low density residential um, surrounding the property. Uh, there is a, the uh, township's municipal waste transfer station and a historic landfill site uh, to the east and an institutional church use uh, just to the east there as well. So in terms of the Planning Act applications required, we've got the, the subject to county official plan amendment. Uh, we've also got a local official plan amendment to the township's uh, official plan, as well as a zoning bylaw amendment. So as I've noted, uh, within the county's official plan, uh, the, the, the lands are designated as the primary settlement area, rural and hazard lands. In the township's official plan, their neighborhood area, hazard and rural. And within the zoning bylaw, it's community facility with a small area of environmental protection. Uh, we did all of the public meeting and circulation process uh, in conjunction with the township, uh, including a public meeting on the 28th and all notification provided under the plan. Uh, so just to, to give everyone an idea of, of kind of the scope of what we're talking about here. So um, that brown rectangle is the entirety of the Maple Grove Cemetery property. And as you can see, uh, it's kind of severed down the middle by that primary uh, settlement area boundary, which forms the edge of, of uh, Dundalk <laughs> at the moment. Um, and it's that kind of hatched area with the lines um, going sort of diagonally um, that we're talking about today. And so as you can see, um, because of the approval of the MZO land surrounding this property, it's created what I've referred to in the report as a bit of a rural island effect, uh, where the, the lands almost entirely surrounding this portion of the, the property uh, are designated uh, within the settlement area. So this, this piece is a bit of an outlier in that respect. Uh, in terms of the documents submitted by the township, they provided a just planning justification report. Uh, we also um, required a D4 study in relation to that nearby landfill and waste transfer station. Uh, some supplemental information was also provided by the township uh, just to ensure that um, from a cemetery kind of growth and retention perspective, uh, that they are satisfied uh, that they have uh, sufficient space within that existing cemetery that's proposed to be retained to accommodate, um, you know, anticipated future growth of the area and those uh, burial needs uh, going forward. Um, I just wanted to point out that um, th that MZO property and, and the lands that are proposed to be merged with it, um, they haven't been given any sort of approval for development at this time. They've only had the zoning uh, put in place by the province. Um, and so at a future time when um, the, the developer does move forward with a, a plan of subdivision, uh, the county and the township will be seeking uh, future comprehensive studies, including the standard servicing study, traffic studies, environmental impact studies, all of those types of things. Uh, generally, we didn't receive too many concerns uh, on the proposal during the circulation process. Uh, just Im important to point out, we did receive some comments from Grand River Conservation Authority. Uh, they confirmed that they had no objections to the redesignation of the hazard lands portion of the property. Uh, it was just an overland drainage feature, and, and that, that, that section is proposed to be uh, altered in its entirety uh, through the de future development of the MZO land, so that wasn't a concern for them. Um, we did receive one comment from the mem a member of the public uh, specifically from the uh, funeral industry services. Um, that person had indicated just some kind of concerns and reservations about protecting the integrity and sanctity of that cemetery space. Um, so we did, uh, during the public meeting, address some of those comments. Uh, 
Uh, we acknowledge at the time of the draft plan of subdivision in future, uh, we could look at some sort of uh, buffering options between the cemetery and any uh, planned residential subdivision. And we also just went back and forth with the township a bit just to make sure that um, kind of from that space needs perspective that they were satisfied that the retained cemetery lands would meet their needs into the future. Hmm. As I mentioned, a public meeting was held on February 28th. Um, there weren't really too many, you know, uh, big concerns or, or questions raised. Uh, there were just sort of some general questions about kind of uh, why the township had selected those lands to be surplused and, and provided to the developer and sort of what the township was anticipating to get um, for that. And the clerk uh, at that time, I thought, provided a really great overview, just kind of showcasing some of the current trends around uh, burial and cremation practices and um, particularly, it was noted that there's been a trend instead of sort of the standard burial plots, um, a lot of folks have been have been moving more towards pre a preference for cremation, um, which takes up a lot less land space. And, and so um, looking at kind of the growth numbers of, of the township, um, the township staff had, had reported that with the retained cemetery lands, they have upwards about, of about 50 years left within their current cemetery. So in terms of key policy considerations, I won't go into too much detail here. It's it's, it's detailed in the report, um, but just a few uh, major things um, within the Planning Act. One of the things that we need to have regard for is, is whether this is an appropriate location of growth and development. Um, that's really echoed in the, the provincial policy statement. It directs most growth to settlement areas. Uh, and Section 1.1.3.8 provides policy around how a municipality uh, should consider expanding an existing settlement area through a process called the comprehensive review process. And generally speaking, when a comprehensive re review process does happen, it looks at kind of all the land surrounding a, a settlement area, and it decides kind of, you know, from a holistic perspective, where makes the most sense for a municipality to grow. Um, but the PPS also provides a kind of a, another provision that says in undertaking that comprehensive review, the level of detail of the assessment should correspond with the complexity and scale of the settlement boundary expansion or development proposal. So I just wanted to point out that because of the um, MZO approval here, it's kind of um, forced the municipality's hand to some extent and kind of where that growth is, is now kind of being uh, moved forward. And, and in doing so, it's kind of created that island effect where it really does kind of impact the um, connectivity of that land and the future development. Um, and so kind of for, for the purposes of, of reviewing this proposal, um, we felt that the, the level of review that um, the township had done in putting forward their planning justification report uh, was sufficiently scoped to, to the scale of this one. So just a summary of the planning justification, uh, the OPA would not permit the more efficient, or sorry, would permit the more efficient residential development of the MZO lands to the north if it were approved. Uh, the proposal would not impact prime agricultural lands or surrounding agricultural operations, including minimum distance separation. Justification has been provided by the township to indicate upwards of 50 years of supply available at the retained cemetery site. A D4 study concluded that the development would not be impacted by the nearby historic landfill. GRCA has, GRCA has confirmed no concerns with redesignating the hazard lands, and the proposed land swap would permit the township to access additional lands to develop a community service hub. So in summary, uh, we feel that the um, application does have sufficient regard for the Planning Act. Um, and is sufficiently aligned with the direction of the provincial policy statement and the county's official plan. Uh, and we would reiterate uh, the, these recommendations. Uh, so that's all I have, but happy to take any questions. Thank you, Becky. Are there any questions? Councillor Brody. Well, I was just going to comment, uh, uh, Warden Mill, that things probably won't change much and that people will still be dying to live in that property in, in Dundalk. It's hard to know how to respond to that other than we're getting awfully close to lunch. <clears throat> but yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're not wrong. Any other questions? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? 
That is carried. Thank you very much. So what I'm thinking is it's quarter past 12. We have the one consent item. Why don't we dispense with that and then we will break for lunch and then we'll come back and do the closed session. Is everybody agreeable to that? Plan of attack? Okay, so the uh, consent item was 6A. It is correspondence from the municipality of Brighton regarding rideshare services. Councillor Greg wanted that pulled, so I presume you will move that, or are you proposing it? Yes. And a seconder for that is Councillor Carlton. Councillor Greg. Thank you. And just a simple question really here is uh, to learn from staff in terms of what our involvement is uh, related to the ride sharing. Like, and it's, uh, you know, grassroots form, it's ride sharing is, hey, I'm in Flesherton. There's an app on your phone. I'm driving through Markdale and I see someone bang and, and then they share a ride. Some of it's morphed into taxis. But for the most part, we don't, I don't think we should have too much of a role at all uh, with ride sharing and, and the transportation. So I'm just wondering what is the role that we currently have? What kind of staffing resources are required for, for supporting the advancement of ride sharing, et cetera? I see uh, Stephanie Stewart has, uh, has joined us. Stephanie, do you want to uh, respond to that, please? Yes, please, Warden. Thank you. Um, and uh, CAO Wingrove, if you can add anything in that I missed, that would be excellent too. Um, in regards to ride sharing, what we're doing right now is we have been speaking with industry leaders and we're also speaking with MTO uh, in regards to different options we can take um, moving forward and what rural transit and in the future of ride sharing and carpooling and future transit will look like. Um, all those discussions are happening. So we're just in that process of kind of figuring that out. Um, as far as I understand, the, the whole kind of concept of this item on the consent agenda is really just to start buying into the concept of having one united bylaw across the entire province, rather than having every municipality having their own. Um, by having one bylaw, we would allow for more seamless travel um, and also just safety standards to be applicable across the entire province so that you know when you're getting in a rideshare vehicle, you know, whether that's in Waterloo or Toronto or Durham, you can expect the same safety standards. So that's kind of what could be achieved by a provincial bylaw. Um, and I think that the idea of this item is just to support it and allow us to continue the conversations um, with the province. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, CEO Wingrove, do you want to add anything? Oh, only just to, to build on what Stephanie said, that at the present time, there's a patchwork of, of municipal bylaws. Some places have municipal by bylaws that actually speak to ride sharing and um and many don't but it makes it very challenging for um the ride share companies or individuals that would be looking to offer a ride share service to operate efficiently and cost effectively when there's not um a single standard in even in, within the area that they they might find valuable to operate in so um if and especially at, at this time when, with regards to um, what fair standards need to look like. Some of those are, are very different um, around the province and even with our own area. So this is Brighton hearing from the industry and, and stepping forward to say, province, if you could help us all here by establishing a foundation from which we can all work, that would be helpful. Thanks, Thanks Kim. Does that answer? Go ahead. Yeah, I think that's good. I just wanted to be certain that uh, we have a framework here that, you know, if someone graduates from UW and in 10 minutes, they create a pick me up app on their phone, that government is out of the way and not too involved in what the private enterprise should be able to and, and how they should be able to conduct themselves and, you know, fill that need in the marketplace. So I think that's, that's what I'm hearing is, is we don't have a lot of involvement at this time. And that's why I was hoping I'd hear it. That is correct. Any other questions? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? 
That is carried. Okay, let's uh, let's recess for lunch. We'll see if we can be back about one o'clock, and uh, we'll go from there. Close session. Yes, it is confirmed that lunch is here.
Thank you, Rob. I guess it's twelve. Well, it's twelve fifty nine. I suppose that's close enough. It's one o'clock somewhere. So, Peter's back. So we're on time. It's perfect. <clears throat> I don't know about the rest of the area, but I had a piece of that strudel. Wow, that was pretty good. <laughs> So I don't know who ordered lunch today, but take note. That was great. The rest of it was awesome, too. All right. Uh, we'll call the meeting back to order. We have three closed meeting matters. Uh, I have a motion here. That the Committee of the Whole does now go into closed session pursuant to Section 239 of the Municipal Act as amended to discuss, one, litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, specifically the Blue Meadows Appeal update for plan of subdivision 42T 2022-02. Two, litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, specifically an update on the appeal of Thornberry Acres plan of condominium. And three, litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, specifically an official plan amendment 11 appeals update so would someone care to move that please councillor body seconded by councillor maybe not councillor yeah councillor nielsen thank you <laughs> appreciate the uh the eagerness there sir but um, maybe not okay uh all those in favor that is carried so scott will just uh and we'll we'll deal with them in the order that i read them so for those for those that have a conflict uh we're going to deal with blue meadows Thornberry Acres, 